What's up, y'all? It's your boy T. Till. Welcome to in another edition of Conversation of the Heart. Um, we took a little bit of a a little bit of a break, um, but we're back. We have a special guest. That I'm, I'm gonna pull up right now, and and then we shall go from there. Let me just try to put. Okay. No. Doctor. Hi, how are you? How are you? I'm good. Good, 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 good. Appreciate you for taking the time out here to join this conversation of the heart here. Um, you know, we are going to jump into a great conversation today. But uh, but for the people who don't know who you are, um, I'll just give you the opportunity to kind of introduce yourself. Um, you know, just let them know, uh, you know, just the kind of medicine that you practice, uh, where, or where they can find you. Um, and then we're going to jump right on in. Okay, I'm Dr. Gabrielle Williams. I'm a family medicine physician in Atlanta, and I've been a physician for six years. And um, you can find me at dr.notmiss on Instagram and Facebook, and then on TikTok, Gab Williams, MD. But I'm happy and excited to be here. Absolutely. So Dr. Gabrielle Williams, MD, appreciate you. Now, that, now, now it's beautiful to see, one, you know, women of, of color, um, and somebody who looks like us, you know, in the medical field, it, it always makes us feel safe. Uh, so definitely a uh, salute to you for completing and, and getting through medical school and, there, and, and everything like that. But my first question to you is why medicine? All right. So initially I wanted to be an accountant because I love math and enjoyed science and then i wanted to be a therapist because i like talking with people uh mm -hmm. if you know me you know i'm nosy i'd be asking the hard deep questions and so <laughs> i thought i wanted to be a therapist but i was like is there a way for me to use my gift of math and science and be able to do medicine um, and be able to help people and i found that um medical school being in medicine was the way to go awesome awesome so when did you complete medical school I finished medical school in 2017. 2017. Um, amazing. So you've been practicing for about six years now. Um, you know, it's not a lot of us that's represented, right, right. in this profession. Right. Um, so how was med school? Um, like, were, were there a lot of us in, in, in med school, peers that looked like yourself? And what was that like? Uh, not at all. So um, for, unfortunately, fortunately, you know, we've come a long way, but uh, we still have... Um, not great representation of minorities in medicine. So in my class, I was one of four or five. And so, you know, you kind of, and I went to a uh, predominantly white school for um, undergrad. So I was kind of used to it, but it's just interesting um, how underrepresented we are um, mm. just in general. So four, so you said four out of five. Yeah, four to five, four to two five students oh, four, in our class. Four to five. Yes, okay, four yes. to five. Jeez, that's that's low numbers right there. Wow, man. So, so with that said, now you've been practicing, and you know, I, I see you on social media. I see you on Instagram. Like you got you full of personality. A lot of times you don't see that in in doctors. Um, so th does that come? With bedside manner too um like like in the way that you approach patients because it seems like you bubbly you love to talk joke around things like that like how does that so how do you input that into your practice with oh, with your patients sure i i enjoy joking around i love humor that's my thing but i also am an introvert so you'll see more of that with me one-on-one -on -one than like in a large crowd so yeah. that's another um i guess uh something that i enjoy doing with patients in the room because it's just the two of us so you know i feel what you know how you feel you know what's going on see if it's a good time to like crack jokes and like if we're cool you know talk crazy with them and they start laughing but they understand like it's all out of love <laughs> amazing amazing so i kind of wanted to have this conversation with you um because it seems like in our community you know like you know especially in our community we'll We'll start here, right? Um, we don't like doctors. We, we don't trust doctors. Um, you know, we always think there's, you know, there's underhanded things. You know, we always think like, oh man, they're trying to get our money, or they don't know, what, right? And I, I understand it is a business. There are certain doctors out there, like, oh, we already know what that is, right? But all 
also what that prevents us from doing is really having pre preventative health or, or, or doing like preventative measures for our own health, right? Um, so from your eyes as a doctor, why should somebody have or make sure that they have a primary care physician? Yes. So a lot of times I find that patients come to the doctor when something's wrong. And I strongly believe that we need primary care doctors so that we can figure out what we don't feel is going wrong or how we can prevent something going wrong, right? So uh, for prevent, you know, if you're just going to the doctor just when you need something or when you have an issue, maybe you're not doing the cancer prevention screenings like mammograms, colonoscopies, and pap smears, right? And also, mm -hmm. Um, one of my big things is blood pressure. I love to talk about blood pressure because I have seen the detrimental effects of blood pressure in our community and, you know, in the, um, in the U.S. And this is considered a silent killer. So you might not feel anything until something really bad happens, like a stroke or heart attack. And so how can you treat something or how can you manage something if you don't know that it's a problem or what your mm -hmm. numbers are? If it even if it even is. So usually at every visit, we're checking blood pressures, we're checking heart rates, because those are things that typically don't cause symptoms and things that we can catch easily with patients seeing their primary care doctor uh, regularly. Awesome. And correct me if I'm wrong here. So, you know, as, as, and a lot of us have come in, you know, with, you know, come into this world, just a lot of us with, you know, our mental health already being in, in the red. We're, some, some of us have been born into poverty and just different things, right? Um, and we're stressed, right? Some of us, you know, have single parent households and things like that. And, you know, just coming into to, to th this world in this way, right? Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but do certain, certain stress affects your blood pressure. Okay. Am I wrong about saying that? Not at all. You are absolutely correct. Uh, stress is a big contributor to high blood pressure. In addition to, you know, salt, lack of ex high salt diet, right. lack of exercise, um, lack of sleep as well, and stress. Yes, of course. So we mm -hmm. need these stressful jobs and not recognizing how it's impacting us. We see it just from um, maybe a mental or emotional standpoint, but what about our physical health? Mm-hmm. And the reason why I brought up the mental part is because some of us have been stressed in, in stressful positions since we were teen kids, teenagers, right? And those things have now you're a young adult, now an adult, and you're and you're always in a rumble. You're always in stress and strife in, in different situations. You know, money is, is, is very stressful, finances, things like that, right? Um, and those are all things that can attribute to um having like high blood pressure and things like that right. so thank you for clarifying that um so when it comes to prevention with high blood pressure let's let's start here since since you were to high blood pressure too what could we do right as a preventative measure to kind of help our blood pressure daily checking it that's like the first thing the only way to know is if you know right so checking your blood pressure at home but we recommend checking your blood pressure in the morning before you get stressed, right? When you come to the, come to my office and you just cut somebody out in traffic, it's going to be high. So <laughs> checking at home is like the best place to check your blood pressure because you're in a relaxed environment and checking it in the morning is best. And then for prevention or keeping your blood pressure, maintaining it at a good range, which by the way is blood pressure of 120s over 70s or less, Low salt diets, salt, 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 water, light salt. So if, our, uh, or if we're eating high salt diet, that salt is in our blood. And so water draws into our blood so that those blood vessels are under stress. So that increases our blood pressure. Um, avoiding um, uh, sedentary lifestyle. So making sure to exercise regularly, that helps lower the blood pressure. Those measures are just as strong as medications, right? They're just as effective as medications. I know it's easier to take a pill than to, to work on those things, but I know a lot of us are going towards natural ways to take care of our blood pressure, natural ways to take care of our body. And so healthy diet and exercise, decreasing stress levels, sleeping regularly, um, actually eating, because some people are not are not eating i eat meat <laughs> so do those things to take care of yourself to keep your blood pressure maintained right so when it comes to sleep so you know I'm, you know i'm going to be honest here uh, i've been trying to do a little better doc you know i've been trying to do a little better right but i come from a city that doesn't sleep 
You know what I'm saying? So, like, I grew up in a place where it, they said, like, listen, sleep is a cousin of death. You know what I'm saying? Like, so, like, we always have this mentality to grind, grind, grind. You sleep when you're dead. You know, I'm from New York, if you didn't know. Yeah. Right? So, you sleep, you know what I mean? Like, you sleep when you, like, you sleep when you're dead. Right? So, growing up, like, you know, like, I got sleep, of course, as a kid. But once I hit a certain age, man, I'm like, I'm hitting the ground. I'm boom, boom, boom. Like, I sleep. And I, so, I became a night owl. You know, there are morning people, and then there are night owls, you know, like myself, right? And then you get older, right? And, and then, you know, you, you get 30 or whatever the case is, and then people tell you, oh, well, you should be sleeping, right? You should sleep eight hours a day. But you're like, man, but there's not enough time in the day. That's, that's, every, everybody says it, and as a doctor, I'm sure you know because you're busy. Your shift's probably crazy, right? There's not enough time in the day. I have kids. I, I You know, I, I'm working and I'm studying, right? Or I got two or three jobs to make ends meet. You know, what am I going to sleep, right? So what are some tips here, right? Like like we live in a world and, and for a lot of us in major cities and different places to where sitting down is, is not a luxury. Laying down is, is not a luxury. You know, you, you go home just to take a shower and go to your second job or school or whatever the case is, right? So what would you say to people, a lot of people, in that situation. All right. This is what I have to say to myself because this is what the Lord had to teach me. You've got to sleep. I mean, it's just a necessity. I mean, it's just a biological thing. It ain't got nothing to do with um, your ability to grind and hustle. You have to sleep because mm -hmm. a lot of people have insomnia, right? Because their mind is always going. And then insomnia, like with doctors, we um, are work long hours and that tends to um, cause us not to be able to sleep. We don't get enough sleep. So then that um, affects our be our ability to think, right? Our cognition, our reaction. That's why they're saying don't, don't drive while you're sleeping because you don't have that quick reaction time. Mm -hmm. And so imagine mm -hmm. a years of chronic deprivation of sleep. Of course, that's gonna have an impact on our health, mental health, emotional health. Imagine like a little kid when they are tired and you tell them to go do something they don't wanna do, what do they do? Act out. We as adults, we might not act out in that same way, but our our answers might be short. We might not have as much compassion and some patience for people or ourselves. And so, to the, the I understand the I understand grind culture. I understand the hustle, but I also wonder how much that's impacting us um, mentally, emotionally, and physically. So yes, you have to sleep. You have to make priority like like everything else, right? Um. You, we all have 24 hours in a day. So we all have to just find a way to prioritize what we need to prioritize. And then there will be time for everything else, I promise. But if you continue to cut down on your sleep, that is gonna affect you later, that you won't be able to grind a household like you used to, right? And then you won't be able to get the things done that you want to. That is, I, I feel you though, I feel you. But I wanna ask this question. Is it really eight hours? Like, because if, if somebody has two jobs, two full-time jobs, they sleep eight hours, they go to work another eight hours, then they go to their second job for eight hours. There's nothing in between it. Right. Is it really is it eight hours? Okay, I'll give you some leeway. Seven. Seven to eight. <laughs> All right, so that, that leaves an hour to get to and from work. Correct. Uh, okay, 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 okay. Cool. Well, I understand. So, it could be for the short term, right? Like, hopefully those things are just to get you somewhere, but chronically... Uh, having sleep deprivation is just not good for anyone. Mm. Good to know. So when it comes to, I think one of the problems that I've always had going, like, you know, if I, if I had to go to the hospital or, or something like that, especially, you know, growing up in New York was the wait times for the emergency room, getting getting in and out, get, being like, being seen, right? right. Things and, and things of that nature, you know, as far as working in the hospital, right? A lot, a lot of times people just don't want to be bothered with things like that. It's like, if I go there, it's like the DMV. I know I'm going to have to just prepare to be there the, the whole day, right? right? Uh, but sometimes you can't help it because you really feel that bad, right? But what is one of, from your eyes, from, from a doctor viewpoint, right? What is something that is prohibiting, like, our patients, or your patients, excuse me, um, from getting the best care that they really need? Cost is a big one. Everyone's worried about cost. Even if they could be having a heart attack, they're like, I just can't 
imagine the hospital bill, the emergency bill. <sighs> and I, and I wish I, mm. like, there's a way I have a magic wand to make costs go away, but I can't, but that's like a, a big problem. Other reasons why people aren't getting care is because they don't trust us. Uh, we don't have the best history with taking care of people. And, um, and also, you know, um, when you see medication prices, you're like, mm, why is this so expensive? This is something very necessary for me to have, right? And then other people have told me uh, their reasons for not going to the doctor, um, in, like including costs in the doctor is like co-pays, deductibles, again, like adding to costs. Like cost has been like the number one issue that people have told me with uh, going to the doctor and just not knowing when that is important to go. They're like, I'll just go um, once every few years, just again, when I need to, so. Mm. So I know that we're gonna get to kind of debunking some myths, but I kind of want to go there now, since we're kind of tethering on that, that, that way we here about us not getting care, right? So the one thing in um, that I do know about you, you're a believer in Christ and things like that, and, and you're open with that, right? Yes. The one thing, that grinds my gears because I because you know as a believer as well, um, and I, and I think this is kind of from from the old school, but it's just like God's gonna do it. I don't, I, I don't need nothing else, right? Just pray about it and you're gonna roll over and be okay, right? To where you don't want to go to the doctor because of 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 those things. Okay, God's gonna take care of it, right? See, for me on the mental health side, I always say God and therapy do both. That's what I always. Say. But I also feel it's the same way with your physical health, right? right? Um, because these, these are serious things, right? I think when we talk about spirituality and, 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 and prayer, I, I always say pray. If you're going to pray, pray that God lead you to the right physicians, the right doctors, the right surgeons, the right things, you know, the right people, right? That's going to have the right hands to, 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 to make sure that you're going to be okay, right? And, and, and that's going to have your best interest. Mm -hmm. um, and I know sometimes that comes from, from an old school way of thinking, but I still feel like that's one of the things that's prevalent today that's just like, oh, you know what, all right, hey, are we just going to pray about it and move on? You know what I'm saying? Or I'm going to go to the bishop, I'm going to go to the preacher and just have him pray for me and then we're going to call it a day. And it's like, there's a lot of things for us as a community too that we need, kind of need to debunk and stop. I and mean, we can stop the foolishness. You know what I'm saying? It, it doesn't take away from your belief. It doesn't take away from your faith. You know, and so as a doctor, have you seen such things or have you, you know, just in your profession or down through your life, have you experienced stuff like this, you know, that hurts, ends up hurting the patient? Yes. Um, I'm, again, fortunately, unfortunately, right? Because I understand the value of faith. I promise you, I get it. I've had to yeah. have faith for my mom. I've had to have faith for my husband. I've had to have faith for a lot of things as far as the help of uh, people around me, and I get it. But also, I believe the power of God is also within us, right? To give us, in our minds, the things that we can do. God said, Jesus said himself, that greater things we would be able to do than what he did on earth, right? And he was able to reach the people around his region. Now we're able to reach many people. We all have, uh, a lot of doctors have similar skills so that we're able to help a vast majority of people instead of just around the community. And I believe that the Lord uses people in order to heal, right? Like that's, isn't that one of the gifts is healing. So mm. as much as I know the Holy Spirit can do it. Listen, I know Jesus can do it. He don't even need me, but also he uses me to help other people. Right. And mm -hmm. I, um, and I, again, like I said, I understand wanting to put our faith in the Lord, only but also i think that also means like all right fine you put your faith in the lord only let him use the resources that he has on earth to be able to help you right Ooh. i think we're just expecting him to just speak and do and the, and then everything will be fine and i get that i get that that's mm -hmm. how he made the world but also he can use different modalities he's not just a right like to how um another way that supports that is like we have different colors we have different tastes like god is not just a singular god and does things a singular way right mm. like he uses mm. different things in order to make things come to pass and so yes please pray pray for me mm, if you're my patient out there pray for me so that i can help you or will use me hello okay 
you're going and you're going to need all the prayer you know being a doctor believe me, as you know um so when it comes to just the importance of knowing your family history you know because again i i and i'm not trying to beat on the old school but the old school kind of set us up for a lot of for a lot of things you know like a lot of secrets everything is a secret Secret. You know what I'm saying? Oh, like, oh, no, nah, we can't talk about this. No, nah, we can't talk about that. Now, nah, you know, what, what happens in this house, stays in this house, like, don't worry about it. Your parents keep things a secret over here. And you, you don't even know, right? You know, when it comes to our health, like, we're not, like why should we know um, our own family history? What's the importance of that? Listen, what, some of the top risk factors for a lot of disease are genetics, because some things mm. to families some may argue dna versus the environment you you grew up in you know tomatoes motto you know we, we <laughs> they're both valid but a lot of uh diseases uh, we get predisposed from our family and let's talk about colon cancer right so typically we recommend for patients to get screened for colon cancer at age 45 um, yeah. and up right however if you have a family history of colon cancer, maybe someone had cancer at age 40, guess when we tell you to start screening? 10 years before at age 30, because there are some um, genetic disorders where colon cancer runs in the family. And our again, our goal is prevention, early detection, mm -hmm. treatment, moving on. And so if there's a way that we can figure out early, hey, you, um, with this family history, since you had, uh, they had colon cancer at this age, let's go ahead and start um, screening you. Maybe we can catch something before it happens. Like, that's our goal, to be able to, to increase um, and improve uh, the health and wealth of our patients. But keeping silent is not helpful for anyone, and I understand why they do. They just don't want to get anyone scared, don't want to claim it, because that'd be a thing. Uh -huh. We'll diagnose and say, I'm not claiming it. I, I get it. I get it. I get it. Uh -huh. But also, if you don't claim it, then, or it, not that you don't claim it, but if you don't acknowledge it, then you, uh, then for sure it will be hard to do something about it, right? If you don't know, if you're not acknowledging, you can't do anything about it. And so, so uh, please, please talk to your family about what you're going through. Hi, everyone. Please tell your family, right? Let them know. Give them insight. You're going to do them a great service later, you know, for their future generation because they, your kids or your kids' kids need to know what's running in the family so that we can get treated. And thank you for saying that. And you know the number one reason, now we're gonna go to men right quick. You know the number one reason why men don't wanna take that test, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> we know why, right? <laughs> but this, this is what's killing men though, right? I first got screened uh, when I was 33, you know? Um, and that, that's my issue is, and sometimes we do it to ourselves. I, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, please, please do. But is I've read that colon cancer is one of the most treatable cancers that there are if if caught early. I'm not, if you correct me if I'm wrong because you're the doctor in the house. That's your answer. My eyes <laughs> to say yes, like, we can okay. cut that mess out and you know what uh because colon cancer starts first starts as a polyp really small and then grows so if we find a polyp snip it off send it snip off, it off. Pathology. oh shoot that was cancer caught it when it was small make sure there's no sign of it anywhere else great and it is a slow growing cancer so let's get our regular checkups right yeah. don't let's not wait yeah. years after the recommended <laughs> screening time to get a colonoscopy if you fellas, stop the nonsense. Listen, stop the nonsense. A, you're like, all right, at age 65, I'm going to get a colonoscopy. My first colonoscopy, to God be the glory, he used me. But if you are 45, go ahead and do your thing. You hear me? And that's exactly what I mean. Because prevention is key. You know what I'm saying? We all get to talk. We want to be macho and dead at the same time. You know what I'm saying? Like, we, like... Get the test, you know, especially if you have that in your family, you know what I'm saying? Uh, because it's something that can be preventable um, before it spreads, like like the good doctor just said, you know, so I really wanted to point that out. Um, and share things with your children. 
I don't mean like babies, but you know, share things with your kids. You know, like let them know so that so they're armed with information so that they can help themselves to to go to the doctor and say, hey, I do have a history of this. Let me get checked out. Oh, my mom had breast cancer. Well, let me go get this checked. Or my aunt had this. Whatever it is, so people know you know, what to screen for. It's not that they're claiming anything. It's just, hey, let me just go get checked so I know what to include when I go to the doctor. Right. Um, which is super important. Um, so so when it comes to, this is a dreaded topic, insurance. Like, that's one of the things I that I also believe stops a lot of people from getting um, good care, right? right? Um lack of or or not the best insurance un unfortunately right mm -hmm. um we all want to have doctors like yourself who, who care like we all we, we want to get the good doctors and things like that right so i always want to ask this this question to a doctor how does that make you guys feel and i know you can't speak for everybody yeah. right but how does that make you feel when like people get denied for insurance or or they, they or they, they come to the office and it's like hey you know we really want to get seen and we have this going on and it's like, oh, you don't have the correct insurance or oh, you don't have insurance or oh, you know, or whatever that is. Like, how does that make a doctor feel? I know sometimes you got to just go and just, it is what it is, but like, does it affect the doctors like that or, or is it just business as usual? Ooh, all right. So insurance is important i'd like but i'm not that i get it because if you get go to have to go to the hospital get a ten thousand dollar bill that doesn't feel great <laughs> and so then you're like i'm not going to the hospital again so insurance is it's it if it does what it's supposed to do it's great however however oftentimes we see how much it prevents people from getting care like you said if there's a medicine that i recommend that you know that you like or even bet this do i'll do you one better you've been on this medicine and all of a sudden your insurance denies it how devastating would that be then you have to pay the full cost or have to switch to a different medicine and again our um a lot of people don't like taking medications me included it's not the it's not my favorite right <laughs> Prescribe it. It's not my favorite thing. And so now you have to switch to a different medicine. You don't know how that's going to, um, how you're going to take to it. Um, or I recommend you get this MRI and we have to do appeals process because insurance denied it. Or like you said, you come in and I'm like, ah, you don't take your insurance. You're going to have to find someone else and wait another few months before you can get seen. Yes, that affects the doctors. Yes, it, it contributes to burnout. Because we're fighting against, we're fighting for patients, but against a strong system that we both, me and the patients rely on, right? We can rely on insurance for payment. Patients rely on insurance for payment <laughs> for, to us. So um, if, if there's a big barrier like insurance keeping us from getting the care we need, then we're like, all right, well, um, I'll just wait till I get better insurance or just don't get seen. Mm. So That's hard. Yeah, that affects, uh, I, like I said, it definitely contributes to burnout, administrative burden, and trying to, again, fight a system that not, that's not allowing us to have a direct therapeutic relationship with our patients to help them. Mm. So then we mm. don't want our patients to get help, and I promise you, that's not me. <laughs> and, and, and speaking of, of having like kind of like that therapeutic relationship with your patient, what about wait time? Just like wait times and you know like just this kind of like rinse and repeat just like all right i'm gonna see you okay and you're on to the next one right I'm not saying you do that but i know that that's experience in, in a lot of places to where they don't feel like they're really being like the patient doesn't feel like they're being heard they don't feel like they're really being seen but that's what does do they really know what I, what's really going on with me? Or that was very fast. Right. Bedside manner is a major thing. I, I, I know with me, when I go to the doctor, the bedside manner is everything. That's, probably, that's pretty much how I kind of pick my doctors too. It's like, how is your bedside manner? Because we're going to have to have a talk. Cause it can't just be just in and out and just work. But that's the culture, right? Just in, out, five minute conversation. And that's it, right? It's like, how does that work from a doctor's eye view? Uh, you know, from a uh, doctor to patient. Sure. So typically in the outpatient center, we're seeing 20 patients a day, 20. 
or more. So we have a tight schedule, again, and strongly influenced by insurance. And so we have to see these patients within, let's say we do 20 minute slots. However, 20 minutes is not 20 minutes because I know oftentimes patients, and I feel that, listen, I am that doctor where I have, in order to respect your time, I have to move, you know, move on to the next patient quickly so that they can get, you know, like there's, we're trying to balance a lot of things. We're trying to make sure patients get seen, seen in a timely manner, but still get the education that they need and still get the labs and whatever orders they need so that they don't feel like they have to come back frequently. But also we have other patients, like we want every, every patient to feel that way. Um, but if we have 20 patients, if we have 25 patients that we're taking care of, unfortunately that cuts into our time with the patient. And so we are now five to seven minute doctors instead of um, having a, a therapeutic relationship with the patients. I cannot stand the fact that I can't educate patients on what's going on. Because guess what, well, guess what happens if something, if a medication reaction or whatever, they're gonna be like, man, as doctors, they don't do nothing. All they do is pushing pills. If I had time, God knows, I would be able to tell you, all right, these are the things to look out for so that you have an idea and maybe not say, okay, no, this is, this doctor didn't mean it like this, or, you know, maybe this medicine just reacted to my body. The doctor told me, hey, potentially this could be a side effect. This is something to look out for. Instead of, nah, I can't stand them. They all do, they're all the same. I prom I, I can speak for myself that mm -hmm. I prefer to spend time with patients and give them the care that they need within that time and be able to have again a therapeutic relationship they understand me i understand them right because it's it's really easy to be like all right your blood pressure is high here's a medicine and go versus yes your blood pressure is high let's talk about why that what are the contributing factors and then what can we do from an without medications to help it okay and then let's follow back up quickly you know maybe in within a week or two weeks you check your blood pressure then we can say all right you know it's still high we've made changes and now you know maybe it might be time to discuss medications instead of just giving everyone a pill or giving everyone an x-ray but we ha we need time right we need time to develop those relationships we need time to, to show you that we're trying to develop good rapport um you know it's hard to do that in five minutes but that's like again we're seeing like 20 25 patients we have a schedule over 20 minutes then we have a 20 minute late grace policy. So then if a patient comes 19 minutes into their appointment that pushes everyone else back and then everyone's uh -huh. like, I had to wait two hours and they only saw me for five minutes. There's a lot of moving factors. It's not just, oh, the doctors don't care. I don't think that's the, the overarching theme of medicine that the doctors don't right. care. I think we, we have a lot of things that we're trying to juggle and um, factors like insurance pushing quantity over quality i think we all would prefer quality care but quality care takes what time right. <laughs> right and and especially you know i'm you know highlighting our community too you know you know it, not that it, it doesn't i want to say this the right way so not that like you know doctors misdiagnose right but sometimes i feel with doctors who don't look like us they assume, so, you know, I've heard doctors say, oh, well, you know, in, in, in the African community, this is prevalent, so this is probably what it is. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, wait a minute, like, that's, that may not be what it is, right? right? It could be, but it could, but it could not be, right? That's why I feel like it's it's, it's beautiful to have somebody that, look, that looks like yourself um, being represented, right? It's, especially when it comes to black women, too, you know, who go to the doctor, you know, and we have OBGYNs and you know, like, and when they have babies and stuff like that, the mortality rates affect black women a, a whole lot, right? And so it's important that you have a doctor that really cares to find out what the issue is right. instead of pushing numbers or agendas or, 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 okay, well, that's just what that is, and that's it, because people's lives are at stake here. Um, so when it comes to, 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 to black women, right, um, and health, um, especially you know, I would say for all, of course, but for somebody who is, um, let's just say, going to have a baby, or, and I know this, this is not, not your arena, but leading up to those things, they have a primary care doctor, right? And, things, and they might share, like, hey, you know, I'm going to, you know, they might have a baby, but like, what advice would you give to this person, to this woman, um, especially a black woman, mm -hmm. um, who's taking this journey because it's nerve wracking, it's stressful. 
Um, and it's dangerous, yeah. you know, to, to be honest, right? Um, and there has to be an advocate for them. Right. You know, uh, um, and, you know, there's just a lot of just different things as far as even with the Roe versus weight and abortion and this and that. Like, there's a lot of pr procedures. It's not just about aborting, but it's just a lot of procedures that, that might have to happen, right? right for a woman, right. right? And if they don't, and if things don't happen in, in, in the right way, that that's their life, you know? So I know I gave a lot there, but just on a scale from, from your view, from your eyes, um, what advice would, would you give black women? Sure. On their so yeah. I would uh, first um, talk about even before becoming pregnant and mm -hmm. making sure there's a desire that you have and that you want, or, you know, if you have the chance to be able to, um, to make that decision before it happens. Like, all right, this is what I want. Uh, talking, again, well, we're going back to family history, talking to your mom or um, the family members in the household and say, all right, did you have any complications with uh, pregnancy? Was your blood pressure high? Mm. Okay. Going to, see, going to see your, um, or if they have any other uh, pregnancy-related complications where, like, the placenta is misplaced, and so that might increase their risk of that happening and having excessive bleeding, like, discussing that so that when you talk with your doctor you can say hey this is also a concern of mine because of my family i just want to make sure that that's checked so another thing is to talk with your primary care doctor to look at your own bill of health right to see how you're doing unfortunate um yeah unfortunately high blood pressure diabetes a lot of conditions affect the mom and the baby while pregnant right patients who have really uncontrolled um, diabetes and can uh, the infant can end up having heart issues, right? And it even seems like how does diabetes relate to the heart? Hello, it's a it's a whole systemic disease, right? So definitely making sure that your health is optimal, or just at least finding out where you're at, right? Getting those health checks, preventive screens, make sure you're good, and then um, uh, talking with friends for sure who have been pregnant and see what doctors they recommend, who they've talked to. But again, it's like communicating is like the big thing. It's like, all right, hearing about your family history, finding out how you're doing yourself, asking around what people who people have chosen, looking at reviews, and looking for someone that looks like you who understands, um, and looking at their website and seeing, all right, what are what are they doing about the maternal mortality rate? Are they even talking about it? Right. Thank you for that. Um, there was a comment that says, yes, doctors do misdiagnose. Yeah. And yes, uh, I'm, I'm sure they do. I think do doctors do mis misdiagnose. They're not 100% perfect. Yeah. But I do feel that if if they were allowed to have more time with the patient, they might find out, you know, different things and come up with different so 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 solutions. And I don't know. I, I used to, well, I still do. I watched that show, New Amsterdam. I, I don't know if, you're, if you've ever seen it, but it paints us such a unrealistic view of, of doctors because you have doctors that go that go against the system and they're all for patients and give them free care and, and it's one of my favorite shows um but it's not real um you know it, it's 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 not real like doctors nowadays like what, what what you just highlighted you you guys have heard it from a doctor's mouth a lot of it is is pushed through insurance yeah. you know it and they don't have control over a lot of different things um especially when you work in the hospitals or doctor's office and you have your own practice or whatever the case is um, a lot of things are run by the big insurance companies unfortunately um I, or at least i know that's just here in america i'm not sure about anywhere else um so so when it comes to i, I know that you're not a nutritionist or anything but when it comes to vitamins right this we have to be you know, vitamins are vital. Vitamins are not vital. They they do things and they don't do things. You know, especially as an adult. You know, I think when you're younger, you get the Flintstones and you call it a day, right? Um, don't know. I, I don't know to this day if the Flintstones did a lick of anything from for my for my life. Um, but um, like from your eye view, are vitamins vital? Okay, vitamins are vital because they help with our um, immune system, just a function of our body. Now, the question is, are multivitamins or the pills that we're taking, are those vital? That's questionable because guess what? A lot of those vitamins and minerals that's within those um, multivitamins, you get from your food. Yes, mm. your fruits mm. and vegetables have plenty. You know, that's where they're extracted from, right? Like, where are you gonna get vitamin C from? 
Where are you going to get vitamin D from? Or vitamin D is something separate. But vitamin C, A, E, K, all of them. Those are from vegetables. I promise you from vegetables. And the sun, vitamin D converts. Right? The sun hits our skin cells, helps you convert for vitamin D. Like there um, are natural, again, natural lifestyle ways that we can um, ensure um, that our health is optimal. Um, but some people do need uh, vitamins. Don't get me wrong. Some mm -hmm. people have B twelve deficiency, vitamin D deficiency, and in our you know in our um, in our country, we're not going outside that much. Uh, so we do need the to take the medications in order to help with. Uh, getting enough vitamin D. So, yes, yeah, so vitamins and minerals are very essential for body function. Um, we can get a lot of them from fruits and vegetables, what we eat, and from being outside. Um, and, but sometimes there are deficiencies where, which require us to take medications for and to replete them. And you brought up a key thing there that, that you mentioned. We're not getting outside. And, you know, now, you know, with kids growing up, back, you know, back in, you know, my day, you know, I, I hate to say that like, I sound, I sound old. Yeah. I'm, I'm not a promise, but um, we used to play outside like 12 hours a day, like bikes, basketball, baseball, sports. We tag, manhunt. Like we used to be outside, right? The kids now are at home inside on their laptops, mm -hmm. right, or or on their their tablets and things like that, right? And now the adults now, a lot of us are in they in remote roles where you know they're inside eight hours of of the day right and if they have kids they're in the, they're in the house for the rest of the day because they got to take care of homework this that and the third that it is sneaky the vitamin d deficiencies that can happen because i, I remember at, at a point i was vitamin d deficient like and i was just like well like how i was just like <laughs> me like I, I, how me. right but then you start to realize like oh i'm not outside like i used to be yeah. right my and your kids aren't either and it's slippery that like, you could sneakily get vitamin d deficiency and it shows in the test which you would know unless you go get checked okay right um so 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 definitely definitely go get checked out uh somebody said the cod liver oil is necessary oh that's nasty i'm, I'm not even gonna lie to you I, i've had cop <laughs> i think different uh <laughs> Nothing different. <laughs> it, it, I'm sure you know definitely necessary, but just whew, yeah. that, that's a powerful uh, taste right there. Right. Um, so, <laughs> so we we we've addressed a lot of different things here, right? Um, so what I want to get into is you. So we we kind of know kind of what the problem is. We know um, what some of the issues are, but how do we change? You know, um, how do we how do we as you know, a society change that. How do doctors change this narrative, right? And I know that you're birthing your own practice. So, you know, you know, I want you to tell us a little bit more about the practice that you're birthing um, and that you're creating out there in 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 Atlanta. Give us a little bit about it. Um, I know it's called Gateway uh, a, a District Health. Um, give us a little bit more about why that's going to be different and, and just what is it and what is it in general. Right, right, right. So to answer your first question about like, how can we change? How can we make this shift is conversations like this, right? Where we're telling everyone, yes, I understand financial wealth and passive income and let's grind and hustle so our kids don't have to. I get it. I do get it. But we also want to be have a great bill of health while we're doing those things, right? So that we can True. really pass this on, right? Because I don't I can't tell you how many times uh, patients have strokes that impact them with their function and they're not able to do the things that they used to and how that leads to how that can lead to depression. Right. So my goal, my goal, my goal, my goal is to help prevent that or at least let's let's uh, take care of it at the initial stages. I'll, I'm with you at the later stages. I get it. If you got a stroke. All right. I got you. Let's prevent further strokes. But how about let's start off first and saying like, all right life is fleeting and we only have one so we might as well um, live our best life while being our best self right while being mm. our best self and uh, for doctors being able to help uh, spread that message is you know uh, it's uh, it's of course we would need more doctors we would need to have uh, like a 
a whole like public PSA announcement of like how important um, health is. And I, and I think, again, what we're doing is helpful for that. So for my practice, again, so based on the way that traditional medicine is and how I felt like everyone was dissatisfied. I was dissatisfied, patients were dissatisfied with the service. We're just com complaining about the same things, but there was something in the middle uh, kind of causing that rift in which I found was insurance. And so um, at my new practice, Gateway Direct Health, my plan is to spend time with patients to develop the therapeutic relationship that I think is necessary for, um, for them to, for us to have a great relationship for, to improve their health and for them to even um, be able to advocate for themselves and want to have better health as well. But if that is through education, that's through time, and that's the way that I want to do it. So I want patients to come to have me as their personal doctor to uh, come in when they need to and not have to wait weeks or months or wait two hours to only see me for five minutes. Let's talk. Let's talk about your family history. Let's talk about what your health goals are because not everyone's the same. Some people are like, yes, I love medicines, and I'll do what I have to do. Some people are like, heck no. And some people are, you know, they're stuff in between let's talk about that right let let me get to know who you are how you think of your help and then let's get to a place where we're meeting both each other in the middle and moving forward uh -huh. to better help the reason why i chose the name gateway is because it means a uh, means to a condition right and for me at gateway direct health where i'm using this model called direct primary care again where patients are, have a direct relationship with me for us to achieve a better quality of life and better health so yeah, so the practice is a direct primary care model or concierge model where patients pay a monthly membership fee for me to be the personal doctor. We get long appointments time, 30 to 60 minutes. And people are like, 60 minutes? What are we gonna talk about? We're gonna talk about everything, hello? Uh, it don't have uh, 60 minutes every time, but we're gonna talk, right? We'll have um, so, uh, no wait time, so you're not waiting an hour to see me, very minimal to no wait time. We come in, we spend our time together, your time is precious to me my time is precious as well and so we're respecting each other's time but we are having a goal of better health a better quality of life whatever that looks like for you and mm. um, and then the plan is to also do video visits telephone visits and even home visits because some patients aren't able to come inside the clinic or might live too far let me visit you at your home so I'm trying to decrease the barriers. I've listened to my community. I've listened to their qualms and uh, with the medical system. And I'm doing what I can to help remove those barriers so that um, patients will uh, take their health seriously and, um, and um, ultimately lead to better optimal health. Wonderful. And that's a beautiful thing. And I'm so proud of that. Um, but my question with that is why don't all the doctors do this? Because um, isn't that kind of going against the grain in, in a sense and creating a different pathway of how doctors are, 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 are even doing business, right? right? Like, like, that, like that's trailblazing um, in and of itself, right? So why aren't more doctors doing it like that? And not that I want them to. I want you to be the first. But I'm just saying, why, like, why haven't doctors thought of this to do this? You know, they have their own practices, yeah. right? But it's still wait times. It's still madness. It's it's still the same rhythm and roll that you would find in, in the hospital, right? So why haven't doctors done this before? Well, fortunately, there are plenty of doctors that are actually doing this. Uh, but it's really? not well known, right? Like, so... So I think part of it is like having to educate the public, like there are uh, primary care doctors and even some specialists that are doing direct care. Because again, we see the problem and we're coming together like, all right, let's figure out a way to, for again, a direct relationship with the patient and the physician. We're not worried about insurance. We're not worried about any of that stuff, right? Because we, the care is within, um, is for the patient and not, okay, what kind of insurance they have, right? We accept people, not what type of insurance they have. Um, I think another reason, I think uh, reasons for why a lot of doctors aren't doing this, it is scary, right? Because then you're introducing a new model. You don't know if people are wanting to invest in this because it is an investment. And it's basically telling people, hey, you are investing in your health. Um, you're investing in the relationship that we're going to have that's going to lead to better health. You're investing in education. Um, 
And then, um, and then a lot of people don't know about it as much as like there are physicians like this doing this. A lot of people don't know about it. So I think oh. those are a few reasons why um, people aren't doing direct primary care. Now, have you launched it, or are you going to launch soon? Yes. So I will be launching September of this year September. in Atlanta. September. Yes. September. Yeah. Yes, in a few months. And uh, already have a website, so gatewaydirecthelp.com, where people can sign up to get um, exclusive offers and updates on the practice. I'm really, really excited because I, I strongly believe like this is the answer to the concerns that I've been getting about why people don't go to the doctor, how, you know, how can I... Um, increase access and decrease those barriers so that we, our whole community can have better health. Mm. And this could be great, you know, for, for people who, you know, who are elderly too, you know, who can't get around, um, you know, well, who don't have great insurance or insurance at all. Right. Um, you know, or people who are in facilities, um, could be rehab facilities um, that can't get to a primary care physician. Um, you know, if people are going to come out to them, I think because what people don't know is, is sometimes when you have an elderly person that's in uh, these rehab or, or, or these homes, sometimes doctors won't, won't they, they won't even see them. Yeah. You know, like if if you can't get to them, right? right? And so you know that could be problematic too. Um, so I really love, love what you're doing. I love this model. Um, Atlanta is is blessed to have you. That you know that that that's number one, first and foremost. Um, and this is something that I just did a series last month on you know being a caretaker and things like that. And a part of that series that we talked about was ha having your paperwork in order, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that is healthcare proxies, mm -hmm. okay? You know your power of attorneys. Right. And, and um, but I'm just going to start with the healthcare proxy. And I feel like I'm begging like Keith Sweat. I've been begging people. I've been begging people. Not for real. I've been begging people to get their healthcare proxies in yes. order. It's free. Yes. You, you might have to pay for a notary. Right. Maybe. Right. But this one thing, the healthcare proxies, um, and, and if people don't believe me, people then people maybe can believe you. Yeah. So, when it comes to a healthcare proxy, when somebody comes into a hospital, a full-grown adult mm -hmm. who's not married, mm -hmm. right? I don't, I don't care if you're engaged. I don't care if you got a girlfriend, a boo thing, boyfriend. I don't care what you got. Right. Full-grown adult. If you go into the hospital, one of the first things that they're gonna ask you is, "Oh, do you have a healthcare proxy?" Right. Most of them say no. And it's a oh, cool, right? Or if you have a single parent or little parent or grandparent and they don't, don't have a health care proxy, you are leaving you are leaving the me, all of the medical decisions up to the doctors normally. And for me, it is not that we don't trust the doctors. Right, right. But when it comes to your family, right, you want to make sure that you're making the right decisions on their behalf. Right. And that you're going to be looped in to what's going on. And I, and I, and I, and I beg of, of, of these things because, especially in our community, right, these are things that we need to have in place. Right? Um, because if not, you're leaving just the health care of yourself, your mom, your dad, right, in the hands of the doctors. Mm -hmm. And you may not get a, a great doctor like Dr. Carrie L. Williams, MD. <laughs> you may not, right? But at least you want to have peace of mind so that you can start making decisions. Right. You know what's going on, right? right? Because now it's like, okay, well, I know all, all about their history. You know all about their things, right. okay? Like, now you can make decisions on their behalf, right? Because you know what they want. That's why it's important to start having these conversations, right? Because Dr. Mike is going to do what's in best of saving a life or doing what's in best of, but what if that's totally against somebody's wishes, yeah. right? Yeah. Everybody has different wishes, right? A religion going on, a lot of different things. 
And so I, I, I just beg that we get our paperwork in order, right? Your power of attorneys. Don't think you can make decisions just because you got a girlfriend. Right. Or because you got a mother or father, right? right? And a lot of people come from single parent household. Oh, my mom's a single mom, my dad's a single dad, whatever the case is. And they don't have paperwork. Right. They got nothing. Right. And you think that you're going to go in and start talking to people. <laughs> no, it's not going to work like that, mm -hmm. especially in the healthcare industry. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like if you got to have somebody go into a rehab facility, are you the person that you can that can that you can speak on behalf of your mother, mm -hmm. your father, your your grandparent? Right? These are things that I just really just want to put that out there. While I have a doctor in the house, <laughs> because it's frustrating. Yeah. It's, it's, it's 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 frustrating to hear certain stories. It's I've had to go through my own experiences. It's yeah. it, it's very frustrating to experience. Yes. Right. And if you have somebody going, let's just say like that has a stroke, right? And they're unable to make decisions. The paperwork is not in order. It creates more stress on the family. Right. To get right. Right. One thousand percent. You no. Know, and, and right. And, and and these are are the things that I'm just like guys. Pre again, preventative. On a different, on a different Correct. side, yes. but it's so easy. Look, go to your local government site or your state site and download the paperwork, get it notarized, yes. and that's it. Yeah, right. And that's where you know I just wanted to bring that out with a doctor here, um, because in our community sometimes it's just that we don't have our paperwork, we don't have our wills, we don't have nothing. Like we don't have these things that we need, and then everything is oh, it's a GoFundMe. Or it's, you know, oh, like, oh, well, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. And then it's just like, now, now we're at a point where it, it's just like your mama's life, your daddy's life. You, it could even be, you could be 30 years old. It could be your fiance's life in order. Because like, it, it's not just for the old. It's for the elderly. It's for us too. Right. right. And even married couples, it's good to have a backup. It's good to have a, a, a backup person just in case, because people go have car accidents every single day, both in the car, right? right? Now they both laid up in the hospital. Who's so? Who's the right? Who's the backup? Who's making decisions? Nobody, right? So I just wanted to bring that out because I'm very passionate about a lot of these things for us to to be better, you know. I'm, um, and having these type of that, this type of dialogue and conversations is so important. So one, I, you know, one, I thank you for, for again for having this conversation with me. Um, and what kind of help tips? Because I see you on Instagram, like you be doing your thing. You know what I'm saying? You be giving out the help tips. So, so what health tips would you want to um, impart to the people who is listening right now um, to kind of to begin to, to be preventative? Um, I, I, I don't know if it's meals or food or, mm -hmm. or just health tips. What kind of medical tips from a doctor's eye view or would you give somebody um, who's trying to be preventative um, in their mind side? It's okay to take care of yourself. I don't know who mm -hmm. I'm talking to in the back. Mm -hmm. but it's okay mm -hmm. to take care of yourself and it's okay to put you first because so that is self-care, right? Not just thinking about um, the things that necessarily feel good, like massage and stuff. I love those. I love those. But also getting a pap smear is taking care of yourself. And it doesn't seem that way. It doesn't seem like it's type of self-care. But you're saying, hey, I want to make sure that I am okay. I want to make sure that if there is something, let's catch it early. I want to make sure that my physical health is okay, as well as my financial well-being, my emotional, mental, all of those things. I'm all for it. That's why mm -hmm. health is not just physical health. There's a you know a whole wheel, a whole pie chart of what goes into health and wellness, and um, and it's okay to put yourself first. Yes, it mm -hmm. might be a sacrifice going to the doctor. I get it. Waiting two hours. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll speak for everyone and say I'm sorry. But it's okay to do that, to take care of you, to put something else aside so that you can. It's okay to stop grinding. 
you know, and and going to bed at ten. All right, we'll just we'll have them tomorrow. Mm. Right, ten o'clock. You know, if you, God willing, tomorrow comes. All right, I'll work on it then. But ten o'clock, yes, it's time. It's time for bed. <laughs> um, health, other health fun. tips: making sure to exercise. Exercise is self care. It's not another to do list. I know that's a lot of. Oh man, the doctor told me to exercise. Just something else I got to do. Something else I got to sacrifice uh, my time for. Mm -hmm. You are doing yourself a great service because exercise helps with. Not only your physical health, but mo mental, emotional, all the things, right? Mm. Eating right. It's okay. It's okay to choose salad. It's okay to choose vegetables. <laughs> Even if they don't taste as great, I get it. But it's okay. You're going to be mm -hmm. okay. Because I'm talking to myself as I'm saying these health tips. <laughs> Telling myself, like, it's Absolutely. okay to choose the things that, again, are not as um, sexy or shiny, but are for health right it's okay and and making it and saying that it is for my health like i'm choosing this because i choose me i'm choosing this mm. i choose self-care and i want i mm. want to be able to uh run when i'm in my 80s hello i want to be able to go hiking and i say with my arthritis and i have that whole bunch of extra weight and i can't move Okay. I think people are saying that right now. I mean, I ain't gonna lie to you. You could be 30, 40 years old. You're saying that right now. Things are snap, crackling, and popping out here. Yeah, I'm not gonna hold you. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, but like, you see these 70 year olds and 80 year olds out here. Let's get, let's get. Know, the 80 year olds moving better than the, them 80 year olds are moving better than the 40s. Correct. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, you know it's very different. Um, So, I know working out. And everything is important. And people call pump iron, and, and but how important is stretching? Stretching, stretching, is very different. As people, yes, uh, stretching is important because then you end up with cramps and spasms. Charlie horses that came out of nowhere talking about. Oh, I think this mess again. Nah, you ain't stretch. I'm scared. <laughs> it could be mess. <laughs> oh, that so you, out of bed, you just like wait a minute. <sighs> yeah, let's. Let's let's relax and contract and flex and extend all the things, right? Like let's move the whole body, not just some of it, the whole body. And the then the uh, last health tip for my people who don't like taking medication, it's okay. It's okay. Mm -hmm. It's for a greater purpose, right? Remember the purpose, mm -hmm. not necessarily um, how it makes you feel in the moment, but like remembering that, okay, I am taking insulin because my sugars are in the 500s and need to be in the 100s. It's okay. Because I want to have my legs and my heart and my brain and my kidneys working. Mm. Speaking so, so, a myth that we didn't talk about: white coat syndrome. I don't. I don't know if it's a myth. I don't know if it's not. I heard it. You know, look, <laughs> people that say because we talk about blood pressure. So when people go to the doctor, sometimes they, you know, their blood pressure is raised. They go, "Oh, I have white coat syndrome." Mm -hmm. So. Oh, you talk to me about this because you're the doctor with the white coat. What is this? Oh, what is this going on with this white coat syndrome, please? Yes, white coat syndrome is real. However, 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 <laughs> so white coat syndrome is where patients have elevated blood pressure when they come to the office, but their blood pressure otherwise. Hello, their blood pressure. Oh, that means they're checking their blood pressure outside of the office. It's normal, and that can happen because pe people are anxious about coming to the doctor. Um, and again, if you cuss someone out right before you came in, or you were smoking, or you were, you know, whatever, and your blood pressure is high, yes. But if you're checking it at home in your relaxed environment and your blood pressure is normal, then yes, then yes, you could have white coat syndrome. But that, again, that takes knowing what your numbers are, knowing what your blood pressure is, checking it the correct way, doing all the things so I can diagnose you correctly. Because there are some people who have white coat syndrome, but their blood pressure is so high, we put them on medicine and then they get dizzy or the blood pressure drops. That's not safe either, right? We're not trying to get too low blood pressure where you're falling, but we do want to make sure it's within a normal range. But I can only go off of the number that I have in the office. If you check your blood pressure at home, we have more numbers to look at. We have, we can do an average and say, all right, this is where most of your numbers are. Okay, it's high in the office. As long as you keep checking blood pressure and it's normal, bet. But if you just go to doctor one time, and your blood pressure is really high, and you don't check it at home, don't be diagnosed with yourself with white coat syndrome. 
and, and, and thank you for that clarification because, you know, the one thing is I want to get people to, um, you know, to really think about their health totally. And, and we have a lot of things. We, we love conspiracy theories. We love myths. We love a lot of different things that's been passed on down through the years, you know, especially as a culture. It's just something that we just do, right? And so, but a lot of that stuff is is preventing us from from being preventative with our own health and it's just and, and and like you said colon cancer high blood pressure a lot a lot of those things these diseases don't present um you know uh symptoms right away um so we're always thinking that we're okay until you're not right right and the stroke is detrimental right. um colon cancer can really be taken care of if caught early, right? right? Pre preventative things that we're talking about here um, that, you know, that we can really, really take a hold of, you know, good practices that we can begin to implement in our own lives so that we can be healthier. And like you said, you know, live to see the fruits of our labor, right? The, the reason why we're grinding, right? Mm -hmm. The reason why we're grinding, the reason why we we're doing all of these things, we're not sleeping and doing, the reason why we're doing that and then we're, by the time we get to a certain age, can't even enjoy it because we're sick or we're laid up. And to be honest, for, with, with what I'm seeing, that age isn't too far, far from 40. Yeah. It used to be like, oh, 65, 70, like people getting sick older. You know, now nah, people getting sick younger. Yes. Right? Yeah. And it's sad and, and dying from an array of, 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 of different things. And this isn't fear mongering or anything like that. Yeah, this right. is real. Right. You right. know what I'm saying? And I hate to see young, especially young men or anybody dying from colon cancer. But I'll be honest, I I I, I don't see a lot of women not doing the colon cancer test. If it's a test, I'll do it. They'll do it, no problem. It's the guys, it's the, it's the guys, the ego, the the machismo. The I'm not gonna get that test, but 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 right. And then next thing you know, oh, I, you know, colon this, colon that, you know, um, waiting too long. Right, um, for screenings and things like that. So you know, just guys, take it from the good doctor, please. Go get screened. Get you a PCP, please. If your mom or dad don't have a PCP, please get her a P Please get them a PCP. Um, it's really necessary. Um, if your mom and dad, the, if they're single or widowed and they don't have a healthcare proxy, please get them a healthcare proxy. Please, it's free. Um, we just want you guys and all of us just 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 to be in a much healthier place in a much healthier state of mind. Um, and if you're in Atlanta, please go see Doctor Doctor Williams, M MD. Um, invest in her practice. She's trying to change the narrative. Um, she's one of us, and I'm so proud of you. Um, I'm proud of the work that you're doing. I hope all the little girls out there who who can look up to somebody that looks like you. You know, and say, I want to be a doctor soon. I want to be just like her. I want to be like Dr. Williams because she's doing it. You know, so definitely, you know, appreciate you. Yeah. And um, thank you for everything. Thank you. Listen, you went in on the on the healthcare proxy and <laughs> with so much passion. I really appreciate that because it, I forget, like, yes, a big part of it is that it's free. You can do it any time, and it saves a lot of heartache. And we don't um, think too, too too far about the future, or um, don't want to think about how ugly the future can be if we don't take care of things now. But I see it day in and day out, and so they're mm -hmm. trying to tell people, "Hey, hey, I know you're not thinking about this, but this is something to think about, right? Healthcare proxy is something yes. to think about. Child pressure; these are things." To think about yes i see i know it seems far something that your parents have but guess what you came from them and those genes be strong that's a bar yeah, where yeah. i came from and so that like that's my job i feel like it's my job to like educate so that people know what's out there or what it and again mm -hmm. it's not i don't want people to be driven by fear and that's why like i use a lot of self-care like that's okay fine if you want fear and you want to look at how bleak the future could look Okay, let's how let's let's think about how beautiful you want your future to look and what steps you can take now to ensure your future continues to stay that way. Mm. And 
I'm, you know what? I'm going to leave it right there. One thing I'll, I'll ask you is be, before you launch, you come back on the show, you know, and, 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 and you know, we'll, we'll do a launch party. You know what I mean? And, 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 and we'll celebrate you and your business in the right way um, because I do believe it can change healthcare. Um, and, and so definitely appreciate that. Um, so tell people where they can find you on all social media platforms and give them the website to, to your um, to your business, uh, Gateway, and we'll, and we'll go from there. Okay, so my uh, practice is Gateway Direct Health. So it's at gatewaydirecthealth.com. And again, please sign up so that you can get um, updates on the practice and exclusive offers. And uh, you can find me on Instagram and Facebook at doctor.notmiss. And on TikTok at Gab Williams MD, watch me dance, talk about my hair, but also educate so people can advocate and they for can elevate. Hello. Yes. Yes. Follow her on all of those platforms. Have your daughters, your kids follow her on the platform. Give them something to, to look up to um, because I'm sure that they will not be disappointed. Again, I appreciate you for coming on the show and having this insightful impactful important conversation on health and everything that goes along with it i appreciate you and we'll thank do this again you. thank you